Hello and welcome back to another video guys, hope you're doing well. Today we're going to take a look at some kinematic questions from the IMAT. Uh, we're going to start with question number six. This is actually an interesting one. It says, which one is not an example of the uh, simple harmonic motion? The question is from 2011. Um, and let's take a look. So number A, question A, I mean, uh, choice A says, the motion of the moon around the earth as observed from Mars. Obviously, that's an example of harmonic motion because it's a sort of a periodic motion and it repeats itself. So we can say that's, you know, simple harmonic motion. As you know, simple harmonic motion is any type of repetitive oscillating, you know, circular motion, which is periodic in a way, which means that you can experience the motion over and over again, and you can sort of observe it. And another one, number B, it says the ripples produced when a stone is uh, dropped into a tank of water. Uh, well, that's also going to be an example of simple harmonic motion because the ripples are going to be producing this periodic effect, which can be observed from above. So again, that's simple harmonic. And then a weight moving up and down at the end of spring, that's a classic example of a simple harmonic motion, just like a simple pendulum or a mass spring system that you can see on a car or a motorcycle. So that's definitely simple harmonic. The motion of the ball bouncing on the floor. We'll come back to this. Um, and then E, obviously, because that's a vibrating violin string and any type of musical instrument with a string uh, that is going to produce, uh, be going to be kind of involved with harmonics is considered simple harmonic motion. In fact, one of the most famous branches of simple harmonic motion is, is involved with the study of harmonics of sound because different harmonics produce different frequencies and whatnot. Now, for choice D, the motion of a ball bouncing on the floor, that's not necessarily harmonic because what's going to happen is the ball is eventually going to slow down. It's gonna bounce up and down and then eventually stop. And then that's not periodic. And so because of that, we don't uh, consider that harmonic motion and we can say D is not an example of simpler harmonic motion. Let's take a look at number seven. Uh, it says a mass is connected to a spring, it vibrates up and down and it forms a simple harmonic motion. All right, uh, system, which of the following are correct? All right, so in order for you to understand this question, you need to understand the effects of a mass spring system and where you consider the equilibrium point, where you consider uh, the velocity to be set at its maximum amount. So I'm just going to draw a sort of like a mass spring system for you guys. Imagine this is a sort of like an imaginary mass spring system. We have the spring that is fully stretched here, and then you've got the equilibrium point, and you have the mass at the end over here. So let's say this is the mass. Let's consider this middle point to be the equilibrium point, which is like the middle. So we can consider this point to be where the displacement of the equilibrium is zero initially, right? So that's where the spring is. You kind of stretch it and you take it to this point. We can say that this is the point where the spring is fully stretched. And right at the beginning here, that's where we can say the spring will become fully compressed if you kind of push it back, right? So if you were to take your hands, and then kind of like push the spring back to the left, that's where you it would be fully compressed. All right, so in the equilibrium point, that's where the displacement is zero. However, if you were to kind of fully compress it and then release it, it is exactly at that red part where the spring is going to move with its maximum velocity. So at the equilibrium point, you also have the maximum amount of velocity. And for that reason, as you know, kinetic energy is highly dependent on velocity. In fact, this formula is one half of mv squared. Because of the fact that at that point the velocity is at its maximum, you can consider the kinetic energy at this point to also be at its maximum amount. But because displacement is equal to zero and you know potential energy is relevant to the position of that object, we can also consider potential energy to become zero at this point because the spring is now actually at the equilibrium and it doesn't have any of its elastic potential energy. You know, all of that elastic potential energy has been converted to kinetic energy. That is why it's moving at its fastest rate at that equilibrium point. Now, once it goes past that point and it actually goes to the fully stretched point, that's where the we can say that's the top of the motion, it's going to have a velocity of zero because it's going to stop for a moment and then come back again. And because of that, we can say that a kinetic energy is actually equal to its minimum, which is equal to zero, perhaps, but its potential energy is equal to its maximum amount because that's when the spring has the highest amount of elastic potential energy. Now, once it comes back to the bottom again, when it's fully compressed, the potential energy is going to be at its maximum amount once again, and well, velocity zero and so on and so forth. So let's take a look at the choices. Uh, Number one says, the kinetic energy of the mass is maximum halfway up. That is correct. Because when you're talking about halfway, you're talking about this middle point. The potential energy is maximum at the top of the mass's motion. Perfectly correct. 
the potential energy of the system is maximum again at the bottom, which means this part, which is fully compressed. So all of them are correct, which means that for question number seven, uh, choice A is the correct answer. Now let's go ahead and take a look at question number eight. Uh, this is a question that kind of involves dynamics as well because it has some uh, parts about friction. But it says a book of mass 0.4 kilogram rests on a horizontal surface with a, co with a uh, coefficient of dynamic friction of 0.5. So here we go. First of all, the mass of the system is actually 0.4 kilograms. Make sure you write down this data. The mu k or the coefficient of dynamic friction is 0.5. Whenever they say coefficient of dynamic friction, you have to write mu k. And whenever they say static friction, you have to write mu s. It's not really that relevant in the IMAT. You just have to know. I don't want to talk about its difference right now. Just know what symbol you have to use. So if this book is now pushed by an external horizontal force of 10 newtons, what will be the acceleration immediately after it has started to move? Okay, so first of all, uh, let's consider this to be the book, right? It's resting on the surface. Uh, the mass of the book is 0 0.4. The first thing you got to do whenever you face a question regarding friction is you have to find the normal force. So this book is going to exert some force on the ground, and we can sort of imagine that it, you know it's going to experience this uh, reactive force, which we call the normal force, or F of n. So you can find the normal force by uh, just finding out the weight of this book, right? So we know that weight is equal to mass times gravity. And so we can say that the weight of this book, or the normal force of this book in this case, because they're actually going to be equal to each other, is going to be 0 0.4 multiplied by 10. So the normal force is actually 4 newtons. So had this been like, you know, 0 0.5, kilograms, the normal force would have been 0 0.5 times 10. Had this been like 0 0.6, it would be 0 0.6 times 10. And uh, very rarely you get objects on incline. And, you know, we haven't seen those on the IMAT. But if you do see them, then there is a way of doing them as well. But for now, just focus on finding the normal force uh, when the object is just sitting on a horizontal surface and it has no angle. All right, now let's take a look at how we can find the friction force. Well, we know that uh, Fk, or friction, is equal to mu k times by the normal force. This is a formula you have to memorize, as the formulas are not given on the IMAT. So mu k is 0 0.5, that's the coefficient of dynamic friction, and we just found the normal force, which is about 4. We know that 0 0.5 times 4, that's going to be like 5 over 10 times 4, that's 20 over 10, that means that the uh, friction amount is actually 2 newtons. The next thing we have to do is we have to find the resultant of forces. So we have to find the net force acting on this book. What does that mean? This book is being pushed by a force of 10 newtons. However, it is experiencing a setback or a not to go force of two newtons. So to find the resultant force, we have to subtract the 10 newtons by the two newton, and you'll find out that the net force is about eight newtons. Then using Newton's um, second law, F equals to M times A, you have to find the acceleration of the book. So acceleration is going to be the force or the net force divided by the mass of the book. That's going to be 8 newtons divided by the mass of the book, which is about 0 0.4. And 8 divided by 0 0.4 would be roughly equal to 8 divided by 4 over 10. That's 80 divided by 4, which is about 20 meters per second square. That would make choice D the correct answer. So that's the answer for question number eight. Just three steps. Find the normal force, find the amount of friction, find the net force, and then find the acceleration. It involves a bunch of formulas, but once you get the hang of it, it's actually a really easy question. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at question number nine, which is actually about centripetal force. All right, so it says the diagram shows a, a mass of, you know, car of mass, blah, 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 traveling at a constant speed of 30 meters per second, okay, um, and uh, the, the, the level rule which forms a circle of radius 50 meters. So right off the bat, I know they're going to ask for the magnitude of the resultant force, which is going to be the centripetal force. And right off the bat, sometimes I know they're going to be asking you for the direction of the acceleration. Just remember, the acceleration is always going to act in the same direction as the centripetal force. So if a car is, for example, going up right now, the centripetal force is a center-seeking force. So it's going to be trying to get the car to get close to the center of the circle, right? So since the force is going to uh, go in that direction, the acceleration is also going to be center seeking, which means that it's going to go in the direction of R. Now, if I want to find out the centripetal force, I have to use the formula F equals to mv squared over R. So R is the radius. I know the mass of the car is a thousand kilograms. And if I multiply that by the amount of velocity, which is 30 to the power of two, and divide that by the radius, I can actually find out the amount of the centripetal force. So I know, you know, I can cancel this zero with this one, 
uh, again, you know that you can use the calculator on the IMAT. Uh, so make sure you uh, learn how to do these by yourself. So you have 100 here, multiply that by 900 because 30 to the power of 2 is 900 and that gets divided by 5. Now 5 and 100 gets cancelled out. You actually get, uh, if you divide 100 by 5, you get 20 on top and 20 times 900 is actually about 18 uh, uh, thousand. So which would mean uh, the correct answer would be actually, you see, by the way, they're giving the units in kilonewtons. These three zeros can get cancelled out and you just get 18 kilonewtons because kilo, as you know, is 10 to the power of 3, which is three zeros. So the correct answer would be three, row three, because the direction of the force is the same as the direction of the acceleration, like I mentioned. They're both going to be going towards the center of the circle, which is R, and the magnitude of the resultant force is actually 18 kilonewtons. So row three is the correct answer. By the way, if you're still watching the video, make sure you hit that subscribe and like button. It would help me a lot, and I would uh, hopefully upload more videos in the future to help you guys out as well. All right, let's move on and take a look at question number 10. Uh, this one is actually a simple question as well. It says a ball is projected vertically upwards and it falls back to its original position. Once projected, the ball experiences a single force downwards due to a constant gravitational field. <laughs> Look at that. It's actually telling you that it's constant downwards and single force of 10 newtons per kilogram. So the three statements are when the ball is moving upwards, it loses kinetic energy and gains potential energy. Absolutely, because as the ball is going up, it's going to slow down. The velocity of the ball comes down. And as it slows down, the kinetic energy of the ball also decreases. And because it's going to go on a higher amount of height, we know that potential energy of a object is relevant to its mass and gravity and its height. And because it's increasing its height, obviously its potential energy is going to increase. In fact, whenever kinetic energy decreases, then another form of energy should be increasing, right? So in this case, it's the potential energy. The magnitude of the ball's acceleration increases as it, as it falls. This is absolutely wrong. And even the question is helping you. It's saying that the acceleration is constant. How can the acceleration increase? So no, that's not correct. No vertical forces act on the ball when it's at its maximum height. That is not correct. Because how is the ball going to stop at the top of the motion when there's no forces acting on it? There's definitely an upward force acting on it and a downward force acting on it. So um, something like that, or perhaps two forces acting downwards, that's why it's going to come to a stop and eventually start falling back downwards. So because of that, the only correct statement is actually number one, which makes choice E the correct answer. All right, let's take a look at the question number 11. This is a classic example of displacement. A car starts at point X. Let's call this point X. It travels three kilometers east. All right, let's say that's three kilometers east. And then four kilometers due south. Okay, let's say this four, This is four kilometers. It's not up to scale. And then six kilometers west. Okay, so that's like double the initial amount. Okay, and then eight kilometers north. So it's going to go here, perhaps. All right. The question is, how far away is the car from point X when it's reached the end of its journey? Assume that all the distances moved on a horizontal flat surface. And then the point X is on the equator. Okay, very good. So we can now, because of the, the fact that they mentioned that, we can actually assume that the distance from this part to this part is, again, three kilometers. Like I mentioned, it's not drawn to scale, but that's three kilometers. And then we have like a triangle here, right? We have to connect this vector, this end of this X vector, to this point of this final vector to find out the distance between them. Whenever you get a question like this, you have to connect a line and you kind of form a triangle. And then you have to find the hypotenuse of this triangle. And luckily, because we know that this is the equator, we know that this part, oops, I removed the whole thing. So we know that the distance from here to here, this part is actually also four kilometers. And this down part should also be four. So as you can see, we have a triangle that's a three kilometer, four kilometer and five kilometer, which means that this part, the hypotenuse is actually five kilometers. So distance from point X to that point is five kilometers. How did I know? Because that's a famous triangle and you should memorize it. It's actually a triangle that has five, three and four as its sides and you can actually get multiples as well if you don't want to memorize this then you can actually use the pythagorean theorem let's say this is c this is a and this is b so you can use c square equals to a square plus b square so you can say c square is equal to four to the power of two plus three to the power of two so c square is equal to 25 and obviously the square root of 25 is five all right let's take a look at number 12 now it says 
An electrical train is traveling on a straight horizontal track. A constant resultant force greater than zero acts on a train in the direction of the train's motion. So if it's acting in the direction of the train's motion, it's going to increase the velocity of the train. But because the, force is, uh, the resultant force is constant, then acceleration also remains constant. So they're probably asking you, what is the magnitude? And they're trying to say, you know, what happens to the velocity? Obviously, uh, acceleration does not increase. It remains constant. That rolls out choice A, C, and E. And velocity also increases. And so that would mean choice B is the correct answer. The reason acceleration remains constant is because force is constant, but a constant force will increase the velocity of the train. All right. And last but not least, question 13, it says a car which is initially stationary, that means the initial velocity of the car is zero, accelerates for five seconds at four meters per second squared. So for a time of five seconds, it experiences an acceleration of four meters per second squared along a straight road, and then continues in the same direction for 20 seconds at constant speed. What is the maximum speed of the car? So for the rest of the journey, it's kind of like traveling at a constant speed, which means that it's actually having no acceleration. So whatever the speed is for the first five seconds, for the next 20 seconds, it's going to be traveling at the same speed. So you can actually say that, um, you know, you don't have to necessarily use this formula, but you can use one of the kinematics formulas of VF equals to AT plus VI. And since VI is zero, you'll find out that the final velocity is going to just be like four times by the amount of, uh, you know, time that it took, which is five. So the maximum speed of the car is going to be 20 meters per second. That rules out choice C, D, and A. So we are left with theme B and E. Now, for finding out how far it traveled or how, what's the distance it traveled, you don't have to use any of the kinematics equations because the car is traveling at constant speed. And there's only one formula for constant speed. It's going to be a linear type of motion. And that's just X equals to V times T. So 20 meters times by the amount of time, which is 20 seconds, that's 400 meters, which makes choice B the correct answer. And keep in mind, whenever they say constant speed, whenever they mention constant speed, what they mean is you have to use X equals to V times T because there's no acceleration involved or um, if it is involved, it's perhaps equal to zero. Uh, but whenever they say constant ve uh, velocity or uh, whenever they say constant accelerative motion, that's a better way of saying it, then you have four formulas you can use. Uh, the first one is actually VF square minus VI square equals to 2A delta X. And then after that, you have VF equals to AT plus VI. This is something that I used in the first part. And then you have X equals to one half of AT square plus VI T. So these are the three most famous ones that you can use for most of the uniform accelerative motions, which is when the motion of, of that uh, object is a specific amount of an, uh, or number for acceleration. But most of the times you will be getting easier questions regarding constant speed or perhaps these three formulas. There's actually one more formula, but you don't necessarily see that a lot. Um, regarding the I math. Um, but anyways, make sure you do a lot of practices on past uh, A-level multiple choice questions, specifically the foundation questions, uh, and that'll help you out a lot. All right, thank you for watching anyways. We'll see you soon and take care.